Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining Councillor Buchanan and Mitchell this morning. Our session today is entitled Paycheck Protection Program, what the Consolidated Appropriations Act means for you. And our presenters today are Brenda Haas and Tom Hudson. Uh, Brenda is a manager at Councillor Buchanan and Mitchell with more than 25 years of experience in accounting, auditing, preparing tax returns and consulting with for-profit, financial, educational and governmental entities and individuals. She's a director of the firm's Emerging Business Solutions Committee and one of the team members responsible for overseeing CBM's Paycheck Protection Program loan services for clients, including loan application and loan forgiveness applications. Brenda's background includes developing accounting and financial reporting policies and procedures, assessing benefit plan valuations, and conducting forensic fraud and divorce tax analyses. Our second presenter is Tom Hudson, he is a tax supervisor at CBM with nearly 10 years of experience in income taxes, personal finance, and public accounting. Uh, Tom is another director of CBM's Emerging Business Solutions Committee and has been the firm's most prolific presenter on the SBA's Paycheck Protection Program since last spring. His experience is primarily composed of complicated business income tax returns and compilation and review engagements. He uses his experience in tax, personal finance, and business valuations to best serve those who rely on CBM and the firm's team of experienced professionals. Tom also holds the Personal Financial Specialist and Certified Valuation Analyst designations. As a courtesy to our presenters this morning, uh, please do keep your video off. At the top of your screen, there should be a little video camera image. If you could just make sure there's a slash mark through it to turn off your video. Uh, that would be appreciated. Uh, thanks also to those of you who submitted questions during the registration process. Those have been shared with our presenters and Brenda and Tom have incorporated them into the presentation. But if for some reason you don't hear the answers to the questions you submitted, or if you submitted them this morning, uh, please do feel free to use the chat box that's available over on the right side of the screen. The presenters will be focusing on the content of the presentation and then ending up with the Q&A format at the end, so they'll respond to your questions then. Uh, the session is being recorded and the presentation slides will be sent to all attendees. So as a final note, if you are participating with your phone, uh, please do email your name and your phone number to either Austin Schweber or myself so we know who you are and we can send you the slides. And with that, thank you once again for joining us, and I'm going to turn it over now to Brenda and Tom. All right, thanks, Joe. Welcome back, everyone, for another PPP session. Um, I'm excited to once again speak about the PPP. I've been doing this ever since its introduction way back in March 2020, which really feels like forever ago at this point. And all I can say about the program is that it's been a roller coaster, just to say the least. So if you're new, to us and CBM and our presentations, just sit back and enjoy the ride. And if you're back for more, then we really appreciate you coming back. And we understand the need for everyone to uh, get this program um, understood and really get to know the nitty gritty here. So let's move because we don't really have a lot of time. And uh, there's some important items that we're trying to cover today in this hour. Again, use the chat function if you need to submit a question. We will try to get to it. Uh, we have a list of prepared questions that were submitted in advance that we will be addressing here at the end of the presentation. So we're just going to hop right into it. But first, let's explain how we're going to refer to these programs. So with the Consolidated Appropriations Act, the original PPP that closed back in August of 2020, it's been reopened. So it's been reopened for borrowers who never pursued a PPP loan in the first place, as well as open for borrowers who were previously not eligible to utilize the program. So we'll cover who that is in a little bit. But second, there was the creation of a PPP second draw, which we will call PPP2. This is a second round of the program, and it has its own distinct requirements, which we will also go into a little bit later. So just for reference, we have PPP1 and we have the PPP2, and they're both sharing the $285 billion pot of money that was allocated for the entire Paycheck Protection Program. So that's how we're going to refer to everything PPP1, PPP2. So first, we're going to talk about the PPP and what is going on with the original program. Specifically, this will cover um, how 
the original program has been expanded for existing loans for all of you that already have a PPP1 loan and what's going on with regards to the forgiveness process. We're going to commentate on that a little bit as well. Um, second, we're going to discuss the introduction of the PPP second draw, which is what they call round two of the program. So I know everyone's eager to hear how that works. And we're going to discuss the specific requirements needed to be eligible for that program and go through really what all of that means. Third, we really want to bring attention to the employee retention credit, which has had significant developments coming out of the CAA. Um, this has the potential to aid many of the struggling businesses out there if they meet the requirements through a refundable payroll tax credit. Um, Brenda will be discussing this in a little bit, and that's something she'll cover in depth, but very important that we address that as well. Last, we're going to run through all of the questions that were submitted in advance, provide quick answers to those uh, that we have that we can at least get you in the right direction so that you can uh, start getting everything you need to get through these programs. All right, so with the Consolidated Appropriations Act, let's hop right into it. It is important to note that a series of changes were made to the program uh, PPP1. First, the one major change that everyone loved to hear was that the expenses incurred in association with loan forgiveness are now were not tax deductible originally, but they are now. So the, originally the IRS made the interpretation that these expenses were not um, allowed to be deducted since the forgiveness income was something that is not going to be included in income. IRS didn't feel that was right. They thought it was double dipping. Congress, with the power that they have, thought that wasn't uh, the correct interpretation. So they wrote into the CAA that the expenses are deductible. For everyone who is separating all these expenses out on their P&L or taking the steps to isolate these costs, you no longer have to worry about that when it comes to the tax return. Uh, this applies for both PPP1 and PPP2 loans. So if you receive a loan through the original program, those expenses are tax deductible. Same thing goes for PPP2. I want to make that clear. Next, to make forgiveness even more attainable, to make this program even easier for borrowers to qualify, which is the main goal of Congress and SBA and the IRS and most people involved in this process, they expanded the list of eligible expenses for eligible uses of the funds. So that includes covered operations expenditures, which is basically payments for business software, cloud computing, tracking payroll costs, some accounting fees. And this was to include a lot of the costs related to kind of moving into a remote business environment that a lot of businesses incurred once this pandemic happened. So those are something that you can potentially include now in your loan forgiveness application. Also covered property damage costs, which they are basically saying are costs related to property damage or vandalism or looting due to some of the public disturbances that we uh, experienced in 2020. Next, there's covered supplier costs. This is a small minor one, but if you entered into a big contract or a big PO before the pandemic hit in February 15th is the official date per the uh, US government, um, you can include the costs in your forgiveness application that you incurred in maintaining that contract or PO. Um, in regards to payments to that supplier. So that's something to consider. Next, anything for covered worker protection. This includes all the adjustments you had to make to adapt to your business to comply with any type of health requirements, things like a drive through window when you're building um, or plexiglass barriers in between customers and uh, cashiers or anything that you may have done to your building to make it comply with health regulations. That is something you can now include. Again, these are all very helpful. It's nice that they added them, but they don't have a major effect unless you were kind of in a specific circumstance. Most of these loans should be forgiven primarily through payroll costs, just based on the mathematics and the adjustments that were made to the program. Next, uh, this is a small one, but a welcome change. There was some clarification on the compensation limits. If you followed our presentations in the past, you'll remember that we shared the interpretation that employees who received $100,000 annualized compensation per pay period needed to be put into a different schedule on the forgiveness application. And we were saying this is per pay period. So you could have had somebody who made $60,000 annually, but did a great job in the summer and got an $8,000 bonus, who would have had to go in this higher compensation limit despite making under 100K annually. Uh, SBA and the IRS, or the, the legislation clarified that that is no longer the case. We're just looking at total earnings throughout the entire year. So if the W-2 is under $100,000, um, then they're going to be a uh, subject in one table. And if they're over $100,000, they're in the other table. Made that way easier for us. And you don't have to go back and look at each, each pay period. Uh, small change, welcome. It makes it easier. Hopping on to some of the other items. Next, borrowers, they're now allowed to choose a, pay, uh, a covered period 
that's shorter than 24 weeks. Previously, you had to choose eight or 24. Uh, now you can pick something in between for your forgiveness application. This is a massive change because of how, of how it might interact with the employee retention credit, which is what we're going to get into later in the presentation. Um, but it, I just want to bring it to everyone's attention. So if you do that, you have to start prorating all the limits and the compensation caps um, that apply to the program. So if you use 12 weeks, then you're going to use half of the caps that were allowed for 24, obviously. But it felt like that sweet spot was really 12, 13 weeks for a lot of people that we've been talking to. And mathematically, that makes sense. On your forgiveness applications now, you can use a shorter period. It's not one or the other. So that's a big change. And we're waiting to really see how a lot of this is going to play out in regards to the ERC. But it's an interesting point to note. And um, we'll have more on that coming as we learn more. Next, group insurance payments. And this was something very broad in the original program. They're like, oh, you can include health, um, insurance premiums. Well, everyone's like, well, what does that include? Is that just health? Is that dental, vision, group life? They made it clear in the legislation from the CAA. That's all of them. Dental, vision, group life. Uh, the different things that you pay on behalf of your employees that can be included as a payroll cost in the loan forgiveness application, which is nice. Uh, moving on, big one here, EIDL advance payments. If anyone utilized that program, that was $1,000 per employee up to $10,000 advance on an EIDL loan, which you received even if you rejected the ending of the subsequent EIDL loan or EIDL. Um, it no longer reduces the forgiveness that you have on your PPP uh, forgiveness application. So if you had received a PPP loan of 150 k and a $10,000 EIDL advance, you previously only got $140,000 or 150 total total thousand dollars forgiven. They make you subtract that 10000 and they didn't want to get you to double dip on both of the programs. Well, they changed that. They get, said, go ahead, we're going to give you the full $160,000 in relief. Um, rather than taking the hit on that. And this applies for people who have already applied. So if you already went and applied for forgiveness, you've been approved, and uh, you're just back here in this presentation just to get more info on the second round, um, you can communicate with your lender, and they will communicate with the SBA that you had improperly had this reduction, and they will go ahead and remedy that and get that $10,000 or whatever your EIDL advance was back into your hands as soon as possible. Uh, next, big one here. The addition of 501c6 organizations have been added to the groups eligible for the PPP loan. So they'll be going through PPP1. They said, we want 501c6s to be able to utilize the program. So those types of entities can go ahead and now apply for a PPP1 loan. They are not subject to the restrictions of PPP2 since they will be applying for their first PPP loan. So that's very important. That 25% gross reduc reduction in gross receipts does not apply to you if you've never used the PPP program and you'll be going here for your first time. There's also destination marketing organizations. I'm not sure if we have any of those on the call, but they are also something that can now utilize the PPP1 program. Uh, there's a few requirements, like if you, you, if you dabble in lobbying of any type, uh, you cannot use the program and they prohibited sports leagues like the NFL, who I believe is a 501c6 from utilizing this program. Um, so that's important to know. Moving on, big change here, and this one is also very welcome and also one that's going to have a very wide impact. So let's talk about forgiveness a little bit. The CAA, it introduces simplified application for all loans up to $150,000. So if your PPP loan is under $150K, then you are now eligible to use this new simplified forgiveness application. The CAA specified, it's written into the legislation, that Congress wants this to be a one-page form, and it's called the 3508S. And that was mandated by the CAA, as I said, and it essentially has two certifications that you make regarding your use of the funds and your reporting. First, you're going to have to certify that you use the funds in compliance with the terms of the program. You have to say, I did everything right that I was supposed to do with the funds. Then you're going to have to go ahead and... Uh, a test that you met 60% 60 60 payroll cost requirement and that you calculated any reductions if applicable. One second on that. However, the instructions on this form also state that if your loan is below $50,000, then you are not subject to the forgiveness reduction. So that means if your loan's under 50K, you don't have to calculate an FTE reduction or a decrease in salary. So if you're falling above that and your loan's above 50K, you still have to worry about those calculations and you still have to run them to make sure that you didn't reduce your FTE count or salaries beyond 25% throughout the covered period. So 
Uh, that's a very important distinction. It's really easy now to apply for forgiveness. You have one page, 150, if you're under 150K. But if you're over 50K, you still have to apply a reduction to your amount if you, in fact, did let employees go or pay people less. So you still have to run through the calculation logic, which is unfortunately a little bit of a burden to do so. Um, regardless, though, if you're using this simplified application, Form 3508S, you do not have to submit and prove your compliance through any documentation to the lender right now. You do have to retain all of that documentation in the event that the SBA comes back in a few years and wants to review your documents to see if you were actually eligible. So the SBA says you have to hold all of this and be able to prove it to us for at least four years. And that's what they're saying. So very easy application process to get this done and over with now, but you need to make sure that you're in the right and you've done everything correctly within the guidelines of the program. And then you need to retain that documentation and it'll be and it'll be something that you'd want to keep for at least four years in the event the SBA does come knocking at your door. But very nice uh, one page. It's essentially two check boxes that say I did it. I promise I did it. And then everything in here is correct. And that's what you'll be moving forward with forward with and submitting to your bank. Minimal documentation. Anybody above, above that loan amount, 150K, unfortunately, you're still going to have to um, so provide the, the lender with all the required documentation to prove it that you didn't have any type of reduction uh, or anything that may have decreased the loan that's eligible for forgiveness. So not a huge change there. You'll still be using the form 3508 or the 3508EZ. You got to run all the math and that'll determine which form that you will be using. Um, so that's something just to note this is only for loans under 150k next i just want to state that the applications available will be used for both ppp1 and ppp2 they're all available on the sba website you will of course be applying through your lender and whatever portal they have set up for you but they've made edits just i believe five or six days ago to all the forms and they are available on the sba website if you kind of want to look at uh, what the final product should be looking like and there are instructions available for all of those forms, which are super helpful to uh, tell you what is needed, what type of documents you need. It's all very clear laid out in there. So if you're looking for info, go to the SBA website and search for the forms. They're very, uh, they're accessible, downloadable, and you can start filling them in there. But you will use your lender for the, uh, the application process, as I said. In regards to the forgiveness process, though, uh, we've seen it's been running smoothly for the most part. A few of our clients have had success already going through the process and lenders have been working with their borrowers to make sure everything is tidy. Don't fear that if you submit it, it's just going to go into a black hole and all you get is a rejection and this is all messed up now. It's not like that. Everything is going to be a communication process and everyone wants to see these loans forgiven. As I've said before, your lender will work with you to get that done. So have no fear. Don't worry about reaching out to them to get clarification on something, maybe your unique circumstances in regards to the process, and they should be able to get it to you. But right now, I think quick turnarounds um, aren't to be expected because I think there's a slight delay and the banks are focused on getting all these PPP2 applications and people coming back for PPP1, getting those open and operational. Um, but I can only speculate being somebody on the outside. So one thing, not spending a lot of time here, but I wanted to bring attention to the issue. In some cases, there was a lot of lender confusion regarding how the program provided for under how the law worked, resulting in different lenders kind of taking conflicting positions on some of the maximum loans for which borrowers could qualify. And as a result, the loan that you received may have been incorrect. Um, this is an understatement, but it, the rollout was a bit difficult and there was a lot of lack of clarity at, at the time when this was all happening in April and May, and we were unsure how this program would work. And a lot of following guidance came out later that gave us answers on how this should have worked, but it was already too late. So there is this, um, in the event that this happened to you, the SBA has been allowed, they've enabled second disbursements to adjust your loan amounts, either upwards to the proper amount that it should have been, the most common cause should be uh, off the top of my head, partnerships who did not receive a loan for their own compensation. That was something was an uncertain item for the first few weeks of the program. So if you're a partnership and your PPP didn't, loan did not include compensation for the partners, you might be eligible for a disbursement, a second disbursement on your original PPP loan. Uh, you're going to have to communicate with your lender and there's a setup process for handling this. Um, contact us if you need help. 
And then also, if you paid back your entire PPP loan before the end of 2020, maybe you thought, hey, I don't think I can use this or I'm just not sure. And then maybe you ended up being wrong and it might have been a great idea for your business. You can go back and get that disbursement sent back to you. Um, and you can go ahead and look into forgiveness and how the numbers all worked out for you that way. Um, next, if you return a portion of your loan, it's also available for you to go back into the program and say, maybe I made a mistake sending that back. Um, and the SBA will make you square and you have another opportunity to utilize those funds and get it forgiven. Just because there's a lot of lack of clarity in the present, in the whole rollout of the program, I think they're offering a little bit of an olive branch here, which is of course very welcome. Alternatively, if you receive too much, the SBA here turns back and gets a little mean and says they're gonna require you to pay it back even if the loan has been forgiven and settled. So if you erroneously receive more than you should have, um, and it gets discovered, you're gonna to have to return those funds to, uh, through your lender to back to the SBA. And I'm very interested in seeing how that one turns out, but that's just FYI. Um, they make it easy if they didn't give you enough, but if you took too much, they don't like that. All right, so probably the most important topic of the day, moving on. PPP second draw. This is the newly introduced PPP2 program for a second round of loans. So how do I qualify? I can hear everyone yelling right now. How do I qualify for this? First, you need to have had a PPP1 loan to qualify for PPP2. I feel like that one's a given. But if you've never used the program and you want a PPP loan now and you meet the requirements, you are applying under the requirements of PPP1. PPP2, you've had to have had a loan already in order to qualify for the program. Next, you'll see here on the slide that the programs reduce the size requirements down to 300 employees in an effort to smoke is focus on smaller businesses who might more so need the aid. In regards to this number, it's always been a simple head count of how many people are on your payroll and does not rely on the FTE logic that has been ingrained in everyone's heads that you're gonna use for the forgiveness calculations. They just wanna say how many people work for you? How many people are you paying right now? Part-time, they work five hours a week, they work 50 hours a week. You just count those numbers of people. There's no logic to it besides how many people are on your payroll um, at the current time at, at application. So that's something to consider. It's down to 300 from 500 now. They're trying to concentrate this second round of aid. Next, the biggest part, most important part, you have to have experienced a 25% decrease in receipts in any 2020 quarter when compared to the same quarter in 2019. So logically, you can use an annual decrease of 25% because mathematically it means that at least one quarter had greater than a 25% decrease in gross receipts. So just FYI. Moving on, and we'll cover that 25% gross receipts reduction in detail on the next slide. But moving on, the loan limits, they've been decreased. Previously, it was 5 million, they knocked it down to 2 million. They're trying to spread the aid, as I said before, so they're trying to limit how much everybody can receive on a maximum of either the two and a half months annual payroll or the $2 million loan. So uh, that's important to know if your loan was around that amount the first time uh, you capped there. Next, the PPP2. It's offered on the same terms, conditions, and processes as PPP1. Forgiveness is going to be the same. You're going to use the same form. The look back periods, they're all the same. Everything is going to be pretty much the same as PPP1, plus the changes that I covered in some of the earlier slides a few minutes ago. Um, hopping on, last, for any of our listeners in the hospitality industry, you can now receive a larger loan that includes an extra month of payroll, so three and a half times your monthly payroll if you file under one of the NAICS codes beginning with a 7-2. So that's mostly bars, restaurants, hotels, et cetera, who fall into this type of industry. They're trying to help restaurants specifically. It's always been something that's on the mind of Congress um, because they've kind of been industries that have been, at least been impacted uh, most of the time. Um, I see one quick question. I can only see it, but affiliation rules, they still apply. They still apply um, just the same as PPP1. I believe there might be one or two small changes um, but that's something that we're not going to cover, at least for the purposes of this application. Just know that the affiliation rules still apply and they're important to consider when you're going back for PPP2. All right, hopping on here. So, Tom, what exactly is included in my gross receipts for the purposes of the 25% reduction quarter over quarter? Well, gross receipts are basically everything coming in the door to your business. One of the few items that you can exclude from 
uh, your gross receipts is the PPP loan proceeds um, that you, that you received back from PPP one in one of the uh, probably Q two of twenty twenty, and um, there's a few other minor items, maybe such as sales tax that you collect on behalf of the state that you will submit and get back out to them. Uh, but beyond that, gross receipts is very broad and it's defined by what you see here on the slide. It includes revenue from whatever form received or accrued and it, it, it abides by whichever type of um, accounting that you currently use. So accrual or cash is something to be considered, but uh, everything coming in the door is what you need to look at in terms of gross receipts. And if anything, work with your lender to see if this X or Y should be included in your gross receipts. Most likely it will be. Um, so just trying to bring attention to that. For nonprofits, gross revenue is defined by a specific section of the tax code, which uh, basically defers the, to the definition as provided uh, by the instructions of the specific tax form that you're going to file. So if you file a 990, the instructions for a 990 have a specific definition for gross revenue and what composes it. I recommend you look there if you're looking for a detailed explanation as to what can be included in your gross receipts. Next week on Tuesday, we are having another presentation that focuses on this content, but specifically for not for profits. So if that's you, look to sign up for that and we'll cover some of those things more in depth. But for now, if you're on the call, not for profit, what you need to do is look at the specific tax form instructions that you file annually. Next, for round two, you can use your 2019 annual payroll or your 2020 annual payroll. You want to use whichever one's higher, but do note that for 2020, um, you'll still be using all the same look back periods for 2021 uh, for the PPP one. So that's something to consider. But just know that for PPP two, you can look at 2019 and 2020 payroll and see which one's higher. They may have an impact on the speed of your application because you have to submit new documents versus um, they have your PPP one documents on file. Uh, if you use the same lender, we cover that a little bit in depth moving uh, moving forward. Next, so for PPP2, if your loan amount is under $150,000, then you do not need to submit documentation supporting this drop in receipts. Um, if your PPP loan is over this amount, then there are a few different items that lenders have specified and the program has specified uh, that have been accepted. This is quarterly financials that you've certified as a borrower. I've seen some lenders ask for the borrower to sign an initial each page of the quarterly financials um, to kind of attest like, hey, I promise these are right because all the burden is on you as a borrower to prove that these are correct. The lenders can't be held responsible for any um, missed uh, requirements or anything like that. So it's on you. And it's, uh, that's what the banks are trying to reiterate by making things like that happen. Next, bank statements highlighted to annotate uh, receipts coming in and out for both of the quarters in question. Uh, that's a lot of work, but um, if, if, of course, if you need this loan, it's definitely something that you'll have to step through. So maybe if you don't have financials set up, bank statements are something you can use. And then also you can use P&Ls, uh, P&L statements that you have demonstrating the actual reduction. So um, in regards to using anything else, uh, you'll need to work with your lender uh, regarding those amounts. Quick question. I thought for second draw, I read that when comparing 2019 and 2020, you were eligible for the lower amount. We can choose a higher amount. Um, I have to double check on that. I'm pretty sure the understanding was a higher amount, but uh, we can go through and just double check. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense um, for even running that calculation. But we'll look into that and get back to you. All right, hopping on. All right, so what have we seen thus far in regards to PPP2? Remember, the program is $258 billion large, so there's a good chunk of money, and there could be even more if needed. Uh, I imagine Congress could potentially react if this program does run through the funds quickly, as it indicates how much need is actually needed out here in the business community. So I don't think that that's all the money that we'll have unless we don't actually use the $285 billion collectively. In the first week, the SBA reported $60,000 PPP loan applications submitted from over 3,000 lenders at the total request of about $5 billion. Um, so again, $280 billion left after the first week. Um, I know it was clunky getting started, so this might not be indicative of the pace that we're going to see. We'll have to wait and at least see what the reporting is for the second week, which wasn't available as of this presentation. Um, and we've seen some secondhand information, nothing official, but uh, we've heard that and, and uh, read that Wells Fargo, they've received requests as stated on the slides about 29,000 apps on the first day for 1.67 billion. Uh, they reported average loan size of about $62,000. So again, there is a big focus on getting out money to smaller businesses right now. 
And there was um, the open, they opened the portals for community banks before they let big banks in. So uh, I haven't seen any statistics or data coming out of that. Um, but these numbers might be a little skewed, particularly at this moment. Uh, we've seen some issues with the rollout. Uh, There's just reports yesterday. A lot of the portals were kind of delayed. Uh, lenders are having issues getting these up and running. Some automated responses coming back that has uh, borrowers panicking, says I've been rejected. Um, I think the banks are struggling with getting this to go. Um, and from the IT side, they really had a short time to react to all of this with, uh, I mean, the bill being signed on the 27th. Uh, near the end of December, and then having to have portals open at least two weeks later. That's a big ask. Um, but we're moving quickly here, so don't be discouraged if any of that happened to you. I know the long there's long wait queue times on all the phones calls to get a hold of the lenders and get through this PPP application process. But um, I understand it's frustrating, but I insist that you stay persistent right now. And hopefully the kinks in the process are worked out soon and everybody can get through um, successfully. I think there's a ton of dough. I don't want to put my foot in my mouth here by saying it, but if you're up applying now, there's a good chance that you should be able to get access to the funds, um, especially if you're already knocking at the door. All right, so just some PPP tips from us here at CBM, just kind of in general what you want to worry about when you're talking about these programs. First, stay with it and make sure you're taking the time to get the application right to minimize any back and forth. The portals, there's been issues. As I said, um, what's this new error? The SBA, their system has been erroring out just yesterday saying there's dormant businesses and they can't be eligible for a loan. That, um, that seems to be an error and uh, something that people have reached out to us about and I've seen people communicating about on public forums, et cetera, discussing the program. So there's still a lot of kinks, but just make sure that you have everything that you possibly can before you hit submit. Um, that extra hour to do that to make sure that everything's okay is probably well worth it so that you minimize any back and forth and that your lender can just send your application on the SBA to get your funds. Um, uh, what else did we want to say? There's $285 billion. Again, I can't comment on how quickly or how slowly that'll go, but that's a large amount of money. Um, just something to be aware of that we're not all going to be fighting for the last dollar. I hope. I certainly hope not. Be patient in waiting for your approval. The SBA, the Treasury, your banks, they are overwhelmed right now with everyone coming after them, trying to get their applications approved, and at the same time, trying to interpret all of the legislation that was included in the CAA. There's a lot of things that have to go right now. And while I understand urgency is very important, um, there's just so much happening right now that you can't expect all of this to turn around amazingly quickly. And I'm sorry, but that's just a fact of the matter. Watch for further clarification or changes to rules. There's not a lot of writing out there in regards to PPP2. It's hard to get good interpretations of the law. That's why we're doing these presentations right now in the heart of our busy season, because we know it's hard to understand this information. And sometimes you just need someone to break it down for you and present it in a nice, clear, concise way. And that's what we're trying to do. But just understand that all of this is moving quickly. We don't have answers on every single piece or every single question that could uh, be encountered in this program. Because again, it's a one size fits all and everybody has their own unique business. And it's hard for this entire group of businesses in the United States to conform and use this one program and to get straight answers. So just be aware of that. It's evolving and look for recent um, guidance from the SBA, the IRS. They're dropping things daily. They love to drop on Friday night if you're bored on a Friday night. <laughs> Go ahead and take a gander. Next, require uh, ga gather and retain all the information and uh, the documentation. It's very important here. Um, you need to retain this stuff for four years, as we said previously on another slide. You need Just get it all together. Make it look pretty. Get it organized. It's going to pay off in the long run, I promise, and you'll thank yourself later. So those are our tips. Uh, what we're going to hop in to now um, is some of our CBM application assistance. This is something we're offering for our clients and anybody who would wish to work with our firm who's not a current client, this is open to you as well. But we have a offered tiered service, a service, a tiered service offering for anyone who needs assistance. It ranges from tier one, what we call tier one, where we prepare on your behalf with all of your information and gather it and combine it into the presentable format that the SBA and your lender are going to want. And we give that to you. And everything should be neat, neat, neatly organized, very clearly labeled, and uh, is going to be what you use to get your information into your lender-specific portal. We will not be entering your portal on your behalf. 
but we will do the behind the scenes legwork using all of your data to make sure that your application is correct and that everything is tidy and all the documents are retained um, or presented to you for retention, to be clear. Tier two, we have, we will review your application. If you think you understand a lot of this program um, and you, you have a good understanding of how this works, we do have tier two in which you can prepare your application, all the documents, and if you just want us to take a second look at it to make sure it's okay and we don't see any issues with it, again, we've been following this program since its inception and uh, we've watched all the developments. So we think that we have a lot of expertise that people would want to tap into and we do offer that as well if you just want us to take a gander. And then tier three, this kind of is, includes a lot of different services. We make our expertise available to you. So if you have questions, you can use tier three, submit all of those to us and we give you straight answers, the real answers that you need if they are available. Um, and that's in regards to forgiveness, PPP1 or PPP2 or any of the anything that relates to this topic, that's something you can use tier three for. So we wanted to make that clear, let everyone know that that is available if you are looking for answers and that we're here to help. And we have a lot of different options for doing so. Moving on here, we're gonna have Brenda unmute herself and she's gonna hop into some very important issues uh, with the employee retention credit. I know we focus more so on PPP mm. and that's the focus of this presentation mainly, but you can't ignore the ERC and Brenda is going to tell you exactly why. Great. Thanks, Tom. Good morning, everyone. Um, so the employee retention credit, um, there are a couple things to focus on there. Um, the credit itself was designed to encourage employers to keep employees on their payroll. And of course, as Tom said about the PPP, you know, we're still um, waiting for some guidance, further guidance on, you know, some of the finer points or complicated situations, many of them having to do with how the ERC works with the PPP. Um, so those um, are yet to come and um, we'll be watching for those as well. So the ERC was um, part of the CARES Act, and it is a refundable payroll tax credit um, for qualifi qualified employers, regardless of their size, and this includes tax exempt organizations. Um, back in 2020, like Tom says, seems like it was more than just a year ago, um, there wasn't much talk about the ERC because it wasn't available to PPP borrowers. You, you know, you couldn't benefit from both the PPP and the ERC. But now, because of the changes that have been made, PPP borrowers are eligible for the credit with, you know, one caveat um, that, you know, you cannot use the same wages for both the PPP and the ERC. So the credit is available to PPP borrowers and it's also retroactive to March 12th of 2020. And the uh, date, uh, the ending date for the credit was extended to June 30th so it uh, of this year. So it uh, spans a broader period, covers both 2020 and 2021. Now the rules um, for each of the years uh, are different. However, um, there are two factors that are consistent um, that are, you know, make an employer eligible. And the first factor is, you know, if your operations were fully or partially suspended because of a COVID-19 order from a governmental entity, or this is not an and, it's an or. Um, so the second factor is it, or if your business experienced a significant reduction in gross receipts during the calendar, a calendar quarter. Um, the credit itself is um, for 2020 uh, is 50% of qualified wages um, and the maximum credit is $5,000 on the qualified wages of $10,000 for each qualified full-time and they're defining this as 30 hours a week um, employee paid between March 13th of, and uh, December 31st of 2020. Now to determine whether your business experienced a significant decline in gross receipts in 2020, it's um, 
similar to what Tom described about, you know, uh, meeting the PPP second draw requirements. You're comparing quarters in 2020 to the same quarters in 2019, and you're looking to see if gross receipts um, was um, less than 50% um, in the comparative quarter. So looking at 2020, did your gross receipts decline 50%? Um, and that um, qualifies that quarter and every subsequent quarter to be included. And until your gross receipts are 80% of the receipts for this same calendar quarter in 2019. So this could span the, the full period depending on what your receipts look like when you compare them. So the difference is then as we're moving on to 2021 and the um, program itself. So the um, qualified wages jump to 70% from the 50%. So then of course the maximum is 7,000 on qualified wages of $10,000 in any quarter um, for the first two quarters of 2021. So spanning January 1st to June 30th of this year. This, the other change that was made is that the decline in gross receipts is now 20% instead of the 50%. So you're going to look at the quarters, the first in the first six uh, quarters or excuse me, months of care, excuse me, the, the two quarters of 2021 to the same quarters in 2019. So the two quarters of 2021 compared to 2019 and comparing 2021 to 2019 makes a lot of sense here because your it, you know, 2019, 2020 was affected obviously by, you know, um, the um, pandemic such that you uh, would need to look back to 2019 to do the comparison and be able to see a difference such that you could qualify for the credit. Um, now, we did receive some questions about, well, what happens if a business um, didn't exist, um, you know, in 2019? Well, then you're comparing the quarters of 20 of, um, you compare to the same quarter in 2020. So you wouldn't go back to 2019, obviously, because that wouldn't make any sense. You would look at 2020. Now, gross receipts here are very similar to what Tom described for the PPP, um, you know, second draw. And it's it's what you would expect, basically your business's revenue. But it also includes contributions, gifts, grants, dues or assessments, um, unrelated activity revenue, sales of assets and investment income. And these were drawn in because tax exempt organizations um, being able to receive the credit. Now qualified wages, um, there's a specific definition for that also, and it depends on the number of full-time employees. So if there are a hundred uh, or fewer full-time employees, if there were a hundred or fewer full-time employees in 2019, the credit is based on wages paid to all employees, whether they worked or not. A little different if you have more than 100 full-time employees, the credit is allowed only for wages paid to employees who are not working, um, so or were not working. And also, the threshold um, changed in 2021 to make it a little uh, easier for um, it, employers to qualify, it was changed from 500 or 100 or fewer to 500 or fewer. And also then similarly, um, more than 500. So uh, em employers between that 100 and 500 number now have an opportunity to um, use, uh, have a credit based on wages um, paid 
to employees whether or not they were working. Um, and you, uh, so practically, the way that the, you know, receiving this credit is that you can claim it on your Form 941, and it's a, it goes against the employer's share of the Social Security tax. And as I met, said at the beginning, it is refundable. So that's one of the questions that's out there is how does that work if you, um, you know, if all of your employer's share of the Social Security tax is used up on one form 941, what do you do then? Um, I would assume that it would go on the next one, but no one has, um, you know, offered that advice at this point. So then here are our tips, um, similar to Tom's tips on the PPP. Here are um, our tips on the ERC. So if you've already applied for forgiveness, um, you want to look at, well, I guess let me just say, um, one of the things, obviously, um, you know, we're waiting for clarification, as we said, and of course, as we know, these programs can be changed and more guidance will be coming. So I think that's maybe the top thing is to wait for clarification from the SBA and the IRS on the program. But while waiting, um, we can be active and, uh, you know, analyze some information and, and see where we stand with regard to the, um, the ERC. And if you've already applied for forgiveness, you want to look at your filing to see if there are any qualified wages that can be used for the ERC. Because of the changes in the program, some of you may have applied for forgiveness and used an, a, you know, a 24 week period, covered period, and there's potential for wages there. If you could have used a shorter period, either the eight week period that was the other option at one point, and now with the CAA, you can choose something between eight weeks and 24 weeks. And as Tom said, 13 weeks is, you know, seems like the sweet spot. Maybe there are some wages there, you know, because you um, apply for forgiveness based on the 24 week covered period. There may be some wages there that you could use to receive the credit. If you haven't applied for forgiveness, um, Go back and review your costs for, you know, the period where you, um, you know, over these periods where they're, um, you know, where the wages are applicable to the credit and see if there might be anything that was overlooked, um, any payroll costs, health insurance, fringe benefits, or the retirement um, or SUTA costs that could be used for the ERC. And then next, take a look at your um, quarterly financials and see, you know, do the math on the, you know, comparative periods and see where you stand. Um, if you actually have, you know, quarters where your uh, gross receipts declined more than um, either the 50 or the 20%, depending on the year. So I know right, this so, is a lot. Oh, oh, go ahead, Tom. Sorry. No, no. Um, so I mean, that was a lot. A lot of information on the ERC. Uh, I think you're just gonna um, put it, put it in summary. There's a big credit that can come back to you if you meet the requirements of this program, and that's obviously a big cash influx, depending on how many employees that you have um, in your organization that can come back to help you make it through some of these times. So uh, we wanted to comment on the ERC to let everyone know that it's there. There's a lot developing with how it interacts with the PPP because just a month ago you weren't allowed to use both, but then the CAA came out and said you can go ahead and use it um, back for the, uh, the quarters that are eligible in 2020. Uh, they haven't given us the how to exactly yet on how to exactly do that. And then really, since you can't use uh, more than, you have to use only $1 towards one or two of the programs. We have to figure out how to really properly allocate the dollars that we did spend on payroll to each of the programs so that you can benefit from both. Those answers aren't available yet, but we just want to make everyone clear, as Brenda did, the credits are there. That's the criteria as we presented in the slides, which will be sent out to everyone. 
And you have to look to see how these interact. It's going to play into your forgiveness, maybe, we think. A lot of answers to come, but we just want to import, uh, highlight how important this is for all of our clients and everybody who is listening on this call today. Um, so with that wrapping up on the ERC and the PPP and the things that we have to say about it, we wanted to hop into some of the prepared questions, and I'll see if we have time here to hop into some of the ones that are coming through on the chat, which are just as important. But first, somebody asked, how's the due date calculated for the PPP loan forgiveness application? That is actually, um, you have through the entire maturity of the loan to actually pay or apply for forgiveness. So these are two two year or five year loans, depending on when yours was dispersed to you and whether or not you made the change with your bank, because you could change a two year loan to a five year loan from the Flexibility Act way back in June. You have until the end and you could theoretically pay back the entire loan before you apply for forgiveness. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but legally that's the amount of time that you have. You have about five years in most cases. Although payments on the loan begin 10 months from the end of your covered period. Before that was probably going to be 24 weeks for most people. Now they allowed you to pick a custom covered period. So I'm unsure really how they're going to see where the 24 or the 10 months starts for you, but you don't have to make any payment before 10 months from the end of your chosen covered period. So most people, if you receive your loan sometime in April or May and you use the 24 week covered period, that doesn't that means you don't have to make any payment on the loan until at least summer of 2021. So there's a lot of time. There's time to wait. And at the very least, if you wanted to afford one or two extra months of time to get your application in, you just have to make one or two payments. And it, it really is minimal with a five year loan with only one percent interest. So something to think about. Uh, somebody asked, should I go to the same bank I used for my first PPP loan? In most cases, yes, because they have your information on file. If you use 2020 payroll information instead, you're going to have to submit a lot of that uh, stuff again to prove what your pay your loan amount should be. And I did double check here when Brenda was speaking. The application says simply 2019 or 2020 payroll. So um, that infers that you should want to use whichever one is higher. It doesn't say anything about uh, you have to use the lesser number or the higher number. The application is clear. You just use 2019 or 2020. If 2020 payroll is higher, obviously that yields a higher loan amount. And that would be the approach that you want to take. Um, what if I need to increase the amount? It's purely mechanical how these amounts are calculated. It's two and a half months of the payroll, uh, the annual payroll. Uh, I hope audio is good. I think it's good on my end. I hate seeing this type of comments, but. Um, I'm just going to continue. Third question, if we sh if we have to apply for a PPP loan, same lender, uh, should the documents be the same? Yes, we've covered that. Um, the documents are going to be the same uh, if you, of course, are using your 2019 payroll amount. Next, are you qualified if you received an original PPP loan but have not applied for loan forgiveness? Yes, all they request is that you have used the funds from PPP1 or you will use the PPP funds. In their in their entirety before you receive a PPP2 loan disbursement, you do not have to apply for forgiveness in order to receive a PPP2 loan. Next, what documentation is uh, needed to show the 25% reduction? We covered that. It's a lot of the uh, if you have P&Ls, if you have bank statements, it, and that's the best that you have for financial information. And then if your loan's over 150k, you're going to be required to submit that information. If you're under 150k, you're going to have to prove it on your end, but you don't have to provide it to the bank. So retain whatever you can to justify that you, in fact, did experience a 25 percent reduction in quarter over quarter receipts compared to 2019. Next question. If you satisfied your 2020 PPP loan forgiveness with payroll through September 30th, can you apply fourth quarter wages towards the ERC for the fourth quarter? That's a very great question. That's something uh, that we're waiting on more information for. Uh, I, we can't tell you yes or no right now. Uh, there's a lot of different interpretations of these these laws and how they're going to work and the way that it's written. But ultimately, we have to wait uh, for guidance from the IRS, who I believe is working on the issue because they just released something the other day um, regarding at least the start as to how these will interact between each other. Next question. Somebody said we received a PPP loan of 170 K and uh, we submit for forgiveness probably in March. Do we need to submit expenses of 170 K? But uh, or if we went over that, um, is that fine too? Essentially, is it just the question? That's a very important question because we, if you're eligible for the ERC, you're going to want to wait to see how that plays out to to determine how many wages you're going to have on your forgiveness application. If you don't meet the criteria for ERC, 
Previously, you had to select a 24 or eight week covered period. So you had to put all the expenses that you incurred for a 24 week covered period. And in most cases, that is way more than any of the loans that anybody receives. So it's completely fine in that case to have an excess of wages on there. But this is something that may be changing in the future. And um, it may might become more important to consider delaying your PPP application if you meet the terms for the ERC, because you don't want to have that application be wrong. And of course, there's dollars allocated to PPP when they could have been used for the ERC. Somebody asked next, we covered this one, how many employees? How do I determine that number uh, for the 300 employee cap? That's people on the payroll. That's simply a head count. It doesn't involve the FTE logic that's required for the, uh, the forgiveness application. Next, what are the provisions for not having a company in 2019, but having one in 2020? Um, so the date that they considered that the pandemic started was February 15th of 2020. And in order to be eligible for all the aid that we discussed today, you needed to have been established and been in business before February 15, 2020. That's clear cut. And if you maybe um, started before that date, but not all the way through 2019, there are options for at least PPP2 and uh, PPP to help you through all the calculations in, in order to calculate all of your loan amount, et cetera. Um, so you might not have all quarters available for 2019 to compare for that 25% gross receipts reduction. Uh, there are uh, rules in place to d calculate that otherwise. And that's something we can work with you with. Um, if you need assistance with that, please contact us. Uh, we have upcoming events. Just a quick shout out. These slides will be sent out, but we've got more on this. Again, we'll be covering PPP specifically for nonprofits moving forward next week. Uh, we also have some very useful strategies uh, in regards to personal finance and managing your money uh, that are coming up too. And then also some on Medicare and Medicaid. We just want to give a shout out to those. Check our website for more information on exactly what those entail, but please sign up. Here's our contact information at the bottom. I'm going to hop into some of these questions that we have on the right, just see if we can at least get the assistance to as many people as we possibly can. Um, I'm going up here. Is there a limit? Somebody is looking for if you have reserves, can you still qualify for PPP1, PPP2? Yes, it doesn't matter if um, you've got a, mass, a surging bank account. If you meet the criteria of the program, uh, which does include the questions about uh, need, et cetera, um, then you can go ahead and apply for the programs and be eligible for those. Somebody asked, what if we reforecasted our budget numbers in 2020? Can we compare the original budget? No, budget, um, the unfortunately, budgeted numbers don't have any play in the PPP2 calculation. It's going to have to be actuals, actual money coming in the door compared to uh, 2019. Somebody said, second draw, 2020, 2019, which one can you use? You have to use a lower amount. Uh, I, again, I checked the application, and it does not indicate that it needs to be the lower of those two. You had me second guessing myself for a second, but that is not my understanding. Earlier in the presentation, we mentioned that an organization engaged in lobbying, it can apply for second draw alone. Was that for only 501c6 orgs or 501c3 as well? I believe it's only for 501c6 because it was in that section of the uh, legislation that did allow 501c6s to participate in the program. Um, I'm not sure if it applies to all 501c3s. They are very careful to exclude organizations who receive a, a majority of their funds through lobbying activities. I can't give you a definite answer. I'd have to double check. Please reach out to us to get a finite answer. Uh, somebody asked, do it has to be a calendar quarter for the 25 gross receipts? Yes, it needs to be calendar quarters. No custom quarters are allowed. Somebody said, uh, thank you for all the info. Would you clarify PPP one option to use a covered period of more than eight weeks, but less than 24 weeks on the application? It doesn't really allow you to do that. Um, on the new one, they just released new applications about five days ago. All they ask is your covered period. Before you had to check a box that said I'm eight weeks or 24 weeks, that box has been removed. What they have is, hey, tell us what your covered period is. So that's where you would select um, how long your period would be and whether or not it's 13 weeks or 14 weeks or whatever you feel like is uh, most appropriate for your business. Somebody asked, what if you weren't open fourth quarter of 2019? look into the actual uh, stimulus bill. It does give you, uh, um, it lays out a methodical approach that you can use to calculate whether or not you qualify for the reduction. Uh, service costs of our tiers, the tiers that we covered regarding our services and assistance on PPP, please reach out to us for that separately. They can change on a variety of factors. So that's something we'd like to discuss with you personally. Uh, so if you're interested in those services, contact Brenda and I here, or you can go through our website and there's a way that gets us 
uh, you can go through, answer a few questions, and it gets right to you, or it comes right to us so that we can reach out to you. Um, I'm addressing the qu chat questions right now. Are you planning ERC once more updates? Yes, we will be all over the ERC. That was a huge, huge mm -hmm. influx of cash for businesses who qualify, and it's very confusing. Um, so right now, we don't exactly have uh, those answers just yet but they will be coming and you can bet your bottom dollar that we will be presenting on them as soon as possible and as soon as we have a chance to read through those and interpret those um so again a lot of questions on the lobbying last last one for 501c6 is it's about 15 percent i believe is the cutoff for how much of your funds are received from lobbying so you'll have to look into those contact us if you'd like and we can talk through those actual um requirements to make sure that you do qualify for the program i just wanted to bring attention to the fact that if you are involved in lobbying at all um, there might be a reason you do not qualify we can work through that if you're interested again thank you everyone for coming to our presentation today i hope i answered as many of your questions as possible i know we could all probably talk about this for a few hours and go through the ins and outs uh, but unfortunately we do not have that time right now if you're interested in our services please contact us as i said emails on the screen Slides will be coming out to you with all of this information or get onto our website and find more of it there. Um, we hope all of you um, can make it through this process. It's frustrating, just stick with it. And we know a lot of businesses are struggling out there and a lot of smart businesses are trying to utilize this aid as best as they can um, in order to ensure that everything goes smoothly. So again, thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Joe, for putting this on. And CBM really appreciates you all tuning in today. Have a wonderful day. And please reach out if you need any more help. Thank you.